to know more such amazing stories from Indian history, click the bell icon and subscribe to Live History India. These are the men and women who have been among the greatest scientists of the world. Nobel Prize laureates, builders of great institutions driving India's scientific research and technological developments, and pioneers whose legacies have been celebrated the world over. India has produced some of the greatest scientists of the modern era. But how did a colony, a young country, and a developing nation manage to sit on the global high table of cutting-edge research and science so early in its journey? The story of Dr. Raghunath Mashelkar, one of present-day India's most celebrated scientists, reflects this. One of the most respected scientists in the world, he connects the world of deep research, policy-making and industrial application and has also sat on top policy-making committees and company boards. Dr. Mashelkar, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you on this series. In many respects, uh, your journey uh, sir, also represents the journey of how we looked at science in India. And I'm going to start with a story I remember you telling us uh, long back about how you uh, came from a small village called Mashel, and that's where you get your surname. And uh, you walked for kilometers to go to school. And how it was really uh, a journey that one sees in movies, but you actually lived that. So I'm going to start by talking to you about your journey. Growing up, did you ever think in your wildest dreams that you'd be sitting uh, at uh, the position that you are today? Well, uh, uh, frankly not. Frankly not. Uh, for example, uh, when I was studying Newton's laws of motion, I never thought that I will be able to sign in the same book where Newton has signed when I became the fellow of Royal Society, considered as one of the highest honors. No, that was uh, uh, not the case. But uh, I'll tell you something, there is a basic principle that uh, uh, scarcity and aspiration is a fantastic combination. It's an explosive combination, all right? And that is how I think uh, if you look at my uh, story of my life, it is combining that scarcity and aspiration. Scarcity not only in terms of our own poverty, even poverty of the laboratories where I worked, poverty of infrastructure, poverty of everything around, as a matter of fact. And then you still sort of uh, make it because of that spirit. Yes, I can, so as to say. Uh, positivism, I mean, if you go to my website, you'll uh, see the first line itself. He's a dangerous optimist. People call me a dangerous optimist. Uh, and and uh, I'll explain to you where does that dangerous optimism come from. But starting with my story, yes, I was born on 1st January 1943. Uh, India had not got its independence then. And I was born in a poor village called Mashel. And, you know, very poor family. And my father died when I was six. Uh, my mother was illiterate. And she brought me to Mumbai. She was in search of a job. In fact, she did many a jobs to bring me up. Uh, two meals a day was a challenge. I walked barefoot until I was 12. I studied under street lights, et cetera, et cetera. And I went to a municipal school of Marathi medium where I actually I studied. Uh, the struggles uh, were terrible. For example, uh, when I did my seventh standard, I had passed with some 88% marks or something like that. And I was trying to get admission in schools, but uh, the 21 rupees fees that were required, my mother didn't have it. And it took 21 days to collect them. And that we also borrowed from her friend who was working as a housemaid in Chopati in a Gujarati family. And that was a saving and she gave it to me. That was the journey. When I did SSE, at that time it was 11th standard, not 10th or 12th. In 135,000 students in Maharashtra state, uh, I had got the 11th rank, by the way. Okay, and still I was going to leave education because I couldn't see the struggle of my mother. And interestingly, it was Sir Dorap Tata scholarship of 60 rupees per month, actually at that time, which helped me 
uh, sort of study. Literally did I then realize that I will be a member of the board of directors of Tata companies later when I was going there and uh, sort of picking up uh, that fees. So that uh, was, uh, I would say, uh, the big struggle. But I'll tell you, in my early childhood, my mother had tremendous influence on me. You know, she was illiterate, but she understood the meaning of education and importance of education and set very high standards. Like, for example, uh, I always stood first in the class in mathematics. Invariably, I got 100%. Occasionally, I will get 97. I was happy. I was looking at that 97. My mother will make me sit down and say, 97 is fine, but where did you lose those three marks? Can you see the benchmarks that she set up? Later on in the life, what happened was, uh, uh, I remember every day was a big struggle. So she had to get some stitching job here, something here. She had gone to Prathana Samaj. There is one Congress house there. And uh, in search of a job, she stood in the queue. And when her turn came, basically, they asked her whether, uh, uh, what is your education? Uh, minimum education qualification was third standard pass. And she was so honest, she said, I'm not a third standard. She could have lied, but she did not because there's no certificate, you know, for third standard. And she was denied a job. And when she was walking back, she said to herself, I have been insulted because I did not have education. And I want to make sure that my son studies the highest that is ever. I don't know what that highest is. And I remember when I became BKM, Bachelor's Degree in Chemical Engineering, I was going to take up a job. She said, no, I found out there is a PhD. You have to do PhD. When I did PhD, I said, now I can take up a job. She said, no, she had found out there is a postdoctoral research and so on and so forth. And, you know, she uh, left us uh, on uh, 17 November 2006, and just uh, three, four weeks before that, I'd got my 25th honorary doctorate. I've got 44 so far, 25th then. And then she said, ah, now I feel happy. Now I can go. So can you imagine an illiterate lady with such, uh, such values uh, setting up the benchmarks for you? I, I think that is where it actually starts. The other influence, I must say, huge influence, uh, was uh, my teachers at different stages. Uh, what happened, because I couldn't, uh, my mother could not gather that 21 rupees very quickly, all the admissions in good schools were closed. Aryan High School, Wilson High School, Chikitsak High School. And I went to a poor school called Union High School, by the way, where the poorest of the poor families used to send there. But that poor school had rich teachers. One of them was Principal Bhave, who taught us physics, uh, who taught us science, actually, physics, chemistry, biology, everything. He believed uh, in not just chalk and talk, but in seeing, observing, and learning. All right? Like he would take us to a soap factory, uh, Hindu Sandiver soap factory, we will go in tram, Five paisa ticket, I didn't have the money. He was also poor, but he would pay for my ticket, et cetera, et cetera. And one day he did one experiment which changed my life. You know, there is always a wow moment in everybody's life. I would describe that as a wow moment. He took us out into the sun and uh, had a, a convex lens in his hand. And he wanted to show us how to find the focal length. And he took a piece of paper like this and moved it up and down and then the sharp point came, the brightest point came. And he said, this distance is the focal length. And for some reason, he held it. And the paper burned. And when the paper burned, he turned to me somehow and said, like this, Mashalga, if you focus your energies, you can achieve anything in life. You know, That did two things. One, I said, science is so fantastic, I must become a scientist. That is how I turned to science. The second was, I said, focus and you can achieve anything. So in my life, because, you know, this is one of the problems with our young people. They think uh, they can do uh, anything, but uh, or everything, but one has to realize that one can't do that. And that focus actually later on taught me other lessons. You know, sure. that is how life is built, by the way. 
uh, I saw different uh, angles to that. And later on, when I become a science leader, that experiment, I'll tell you how it helped me in science leadership. So what happened was that I started thinking about it. If you look at the uh, convex lens, sun's rays are parallel, okay? And what is the property of parallel lines? They don't meet. What does convex lens do? It makes them meet. You can see our country now, race, religion, language, you know, you require a convex lens leadership to bring it together. Right. So when I became director of National Chemical Laboratory, we had inorganic chemistry division, organic chemistry division, physical chemistry division, polymer chemistry division, 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 division. division. It was not one laboratory. I said nothing but one MCL. Even my budgets, etc. you know, I, I changed the complete pattern and made team MCL, one MCL. When I became the director general of CSR, there were 40 laboratories, like National Chemical Laboratory in Pune, National Aerospace Laboratory in Bangalore, National Physical Laboratory in Delhi, et cetera. They all behaved as though they were uh, the 40 separate uh, entities. Mm -hmm. I said, nothing doing. Team CSR, one CSR, all right? And whereas when I took over, two laboratories were not talking to each other. I remember when I left, there were 19 laboratories. There was one project where 19 laboratories were working together. In fact, I remember uh, 11 May 1998, uh, in Bangalore, there was a director's meeting. And I remember that day because that's a celebrated as a technology day. Uh, and there are things related to that. I'll not get into that. But all my directors signed, 40 directors on one page, saying that India matters to us. We want to matter to India more. Can you just imagine? That is how the CSR talks. That was, that was wonderful. You know, every time I listen to you, every time I read uh, anything that you've written, it's full of insights. And one of the favorite uh, formulas that I love about, uh, that you have uh, spoken about, which I love, is E is equal to F, education is equal to the future. <laughs> and, <Yes. laughs> and you've been quoted as saying that uh, it's not the, the most important formula in life is not E is equal to MC squared, but E is equal to F. Ah, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, there is an interesting story about it. What happened was that, was I was in a uh, young scientists were talking to each other and so on and so forth. And as usual, uh, my uh, sort of emphasis is on, yeah, not follow, lead, create something new. So uh, uh, then we were talking about what are the greatest equations that uh, have been created by scientists and India must create one. So somebody said Newton's law, force equal to mass into acceleration. Somebody said Einstein, you know, uh, e equal to mc square. And then and they came to me, but you're not saying anything. I said, not Newton, not Einstein. It is E equal to F. education is equal to future. Fantastic. And, yeah. And then I actually, uh, by the way, when I mentioned this in a gathering, I also say that as a scientist, not only am I supposed to propose an equation, I must prove it. So I prove it in the following way, by the way. I tell them that on 17 March 2000, I got Padma Bhushan. And that was given by K.R. Narayanan, the then president. And along with me, who got it? Radhan Tata. Now you can just imagine, K.R. Narayanan was born in a very poor family. He walked kilometers like I did. He used to stand outside the class and take notes because his uh, parents did not have uh, uh, the, uh, you know, uh, the wherewithal of giving him the tuition fees. And he could study because of Tata scholarship. I did my story, as you, as you know, very similar to him. I could study because of Tata scholarship. He became president, E equal to F, education equal to future. I became a Padma Bhushan awardee, E equal to F. But the person who made it happen or whose family, Tata's, Ratan Tata. Can you imagine the person who received the Tata scholarship and built his future was giving Padma Bhushan to Ratan Tata. That is the proof. That is why education, education, and education, and not just education meaning, but it is right to education, to right education, to right way of education. I think that is the challenge. Okay, I have lots of questions on the education front, but I'm going to ask you a couple of questions on how uh, the scientific community or scientific institutions were when you started out. Because what is also interesting about your story, sir, is that you're a homegrown success story. You did not uh, go for your PhD overseas. And 
you know, the, by, by the 60s when you were studying, there was already the beginning of the brain drain. But I'm going to rewind a little bit and go to the generation before yours. We've had some fabulous scientists, of course, Nobel, uh, Nobel laureates, et cetera. But we've also had people who built great institutions. I'm talking about Hobi Baba, I'm talking about Vikram Saravai, I'm talking about Shanti Swarup uh, Bhatnagar, who was, of course, also a, a, a chemical engineer, set up the CSIR. Uh, you know, and what were the influence that these men had on, on a young engineering student when you were up? And what, looking back at their legacy from where you're sitting, what was, uh, why were they so successful in what they did? Yeah, yeah. I think that's a very important question. Let me begin by saying, as you said, I am homegrown, yeah. I remember I always stood first, et cetera. So uh, when I became a bachelor's degree of chemical engineering, when I got, actually I had four or five fellowships from US. Mm -hmm. And the convention was to go there, right? Always. But Mrs. M.M. Sharma, by the way, who had just returned from Cambridge, had become a full fledged professor, by the way, at the age of 27. He dazzled me so much that I said, uh, where can, else can I get a great guru? So I did the most unusual. I said, forget about those fellowships. I will do my PhD here. That was uh, very uh, different from anybody else did at that time. And then having done that, I went for a postdoctoral uh, search, etc. But I remember I was doing very well. I had established a school on non-Newtonian fluid mechanics, uh, an area that I knew nothing about. And it had become kind of worked out. I had offers from US and then Dr. Nayaduma, the then Director General of CSI, by the way, actually he came to London and I got a telex from Dr. B.D. Tilak, my Director of National Cape Theory, go and meet him. There was a telex in those days, okay? And he didn't say why, but he was my guru and you always listen to guru, so I went. And I remember when I walked in, I did not even realize that I'm going to say, yes, I'm coming back. Because, you know, my challenge is, I think from here, not from here. And I came back on a salary of uh, 2,100 rupees per month at that time. But you talk about the kind of conditions under which we did science. It's incredible. You know, young people will not even realize that, that in order to get a telephone, it used to take six years at that time. You know, as far as the labs were concerned, uh, our journals would come by sea mail. So three to four months late. That means we are out of competition already because we did not know what happened in the rest of the world because there was no other communication uh, at all and so on. My first uh, uh, Weisenberg Reorganometer that I wanted to pursue my research would take two years, you know? But there is an important thing. I always tell uh, the uh, 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 students, young students in particular, that you keep on knocking on the doors of opportunity. They don't open, then what do you do? you open your own doors. So when that equipment wouldn't come and I had to wait for two years, I said, I'll change my field. What has God given me? This. And I went into modeling and simulation, changing the complete field. And can you believe it? 77, I began that work. 82, I got the Bhatnagar Prize, SS Bhatnagar Prize, which is the highest that you get when you are less than sort of 45. Okay? And later on, with that scarcity of resources, because it is not uh, the power of uh, the budget, the power of idea that matters. We did research. And like most of my gen uh, generation did research in that way only. It was not a uh, resource. I mean, if you go back to the great names uh, like Sir J.C. Bose, S.N. Bose, uh, Ramanujan, uh, even C.V. Raman, et cetera, et cetera. It was the power of ideas that actually uh, sort of mattered. And we always remember that. We took inspiration from that. I want to talk about these institution builders. Uh, you know, Shanti Sarup Bhattagar uh, was a great man. Uh, I, what I find amazing is the vision with which they, they uh, set up these institutions. You know, they didn't see India as a developing country trying to make a mark. They saw India as a country of great knowledge, created world-class institutions, and said, we will sit directly on the world table. And I think that that, that ambition, which stemmed from the personality of these men, Homi Baba, Vikram Saravai, Shanti Surubhat Nagar, and many others like them. You know, that also created a certain amount of confidence in the way we looked at uh, uh, institutions. So I want your uh, perspective on these men and the institutions they created. 
Oh, yes. Uh, they, they were great. I think uh, we owe so much to them, whether it was uh, uh, Vikram Sarabhai, it was uh, Homi Bhabha, it was uh, Bhatnagar, etc. They were not just institution builder. They had the vision, uh, uh, you know, of uh, uh, the future. Uh, when it comes to CSIR, Council of Scientific Industrial Research, for example, I remember the number of institutions in different areas that came up. And there used to be always a perfect equation, by the way, between the prime minister and these. In fact, there is a famous story that um, uh, SS Bhatnagar would want to meet uh, Prime Minister Nehru. And he would say, come come for a breakfast. And then he will be scratching his head, oh, so you want a new lab. What is that? And that was done. You, you know, that, that that is how sort of that trust and confidence uh, that was built. But when you build institutions, how do you sustain them is a big challenge, always, OK? And for that, I must say, context decides the content. And therefore, with context, if you don't change, then uh, sort of uh, you are. And therefore, the leadership is all about making uh, institutions sustainable. I will give you ex uh, my own experience on carrying out the legacy and making uh, CSR sustainable. Uh, if you look at CSR, the transformation that we did in the 90s, by the way, if you look at Jain Narlika's book on scientific age, he has listed the top 10 achievements of Indian science and technology in the 20th century. It starts with Ramanujan, okay? Then it goes to Meghnad Saha, for example, you know, stellar astrophysics. Then it goes to SN Bose, as you know, Bose Einstein condensate and the sort of rest of it, Sir C.V. Raman, okay? Jain Ramchandran, who solved the triple helix. So they were all fundamental science. Later on, it becomes green revolution, space. You talked about Vikram Sarabhai, nuclear energy. You talked about Bhava. And the last one is CSR transformation, which we did in 90s. Okay. Now, what was the important part about that transformation? The first was it is a council of scientific and industrial research. Yeah. And that and was taken very seriously. Either you did scientific research or you do industrial research. There was no connect between the two. Whereas if you want to create technologies which are world class, they have to be based on high level of science. So I said, drop the word and. That was number one. Number two was the team CSR part of it. So as to say, you know, uh, it is always not one plus one equal to two. One plus one equal to 11. How do you create that? Bringing them together. The third is, Industrial research implies that invention is not good enough. It has to be innovation. Innovation is successful exploitation of a new idea in practice. So you have to walk the entire sort of journey. And therefore, how do you make it attractive for scientists to do industrial research? Because if they are creating wealth, then that part of the wealth should go to them. What's wrong, in that? What's wrong in that? And we sort of created systems by which out of the net royalty earning or whatever, et cetera, the lab doesn't take 100%. Two thirds of it goes to the scientists. Similarly, the labs who do outstanding industrial research, we created incentives for them. For example, the extra earning that we had, previously they used to just go to headquarters to, to, to Delhi in a black hole. I said, nothing good. If they have created it, let it remain as a lab reserve. And the director will have complete freedom to use it the way he wants. Otherwise, for everything, they had to come to Delhi. I said, nobody will come to Delhi. I love you all, but we can talk on phone and you uh, uh, do everything. The result of that was, and by the way, the surplus was the price minus cost. <laughs> what did it mean? They wanted to become more efficient by reducing the cost. So the laboratories became more efficient. And price. Industry will not pay them the price if you don't create more and more value by creating high technology and so on. And there were occasions where labs had more reserves than the budget I was giving. So they started becoming kind of self-reliant. You know, that was the kind of transformation that we had. And, and this is very important, but I want to ask you, you know, since this is also a look back at the making of modern India, the hundred years that shaped India from 1900 to 2000, I'm also going to ask you, you know, a, Today you get a lot of flack uh, or a lot of, there's a lot of criticism against uh, the planned economy that we started off with, uh, with uh, Jawaharlal Nehru, you know, looking at the five-year plans, et cetera. 
But one could argue that our thrust in science was also a factor of the fact that agriculture and industry were seen as two pillars and they were seen as important pillars to invest behind. And when you looked at investing behind it, you looked at a, a, a holistic picture and education was a very big part of it. So all your greatest institutions, today, the Indian Institute of uh, Technology, all, the, all of them, most of them in fact, come from this era. So do you think that in a sense that this was a very formative period and a lot of the growth that we are seeing today is also because of this thrust in science. It is a very, very conscious decision to move towards this. Absolutely. If we are post-independent, we are said, oh, we are a poor country, we can't afford an Indian Institute of Management, Indian Institute of Technology, etc. Where would I be? We created these institutions at a time uh, you know, when poverty was written all over India. Today, it's a very uh, different uh, uh, matter. So institution building is critical. Investment in science to recognize at that time the importance of space technology, nuclear technology, all right, etc., etc., was very important. It was easy to understand the importance of agriculture, but not so easy to look at uh, high technologies and saying that we must build. Without that base today, today we take uh, pride in the fact that Mars Orbiter mission were the first country to be successful in the first effort, et cetera, et cetera. But that was because of the base that we at a, a point in time built. The other important point, again, I come back to the context deciding the content, all right? I'll tell you an interesting story because this is where I emphasize that our potential is up here. We operate here and given a challenge, we can uh, sort of write there. Let me give an example. Again, from my personal book of life. When I became director of National Chemical Laboratory in 1989, 1st June, I remember I uh, sort of called the entire laboratory and in an auditorium of 560, there were 1200 people, basically. You can just imagine the scene. And I gave them a vision. And the vision was the following. I said 1989 is two years before liberalization, by the way. What we're doing, we're doing reverse engineering. We're copying, okay? And uh, that helped us, of course, uh, but the context was changing. And I said that anytime we are, so, so we are just following, we are copying. I said, no, we have to be ahead of the rest of the world. We have to lead, okay? And I said, anytime I do anything uh, which is ahead of the rest of the world, I go to Indian industry. They ask me, but have they done it? Has Japan done it? Has the US done it? If they are not, then how can you? So I said, what am I selling knowledge? And what is my market? The whole world. It was an audacious idea, by the way. So I said that we'll be, we should be exporting our knowledge, uh, you know, uh, to the best in the world. And I'm a, a, a polymer person, by the way, a polymer yeah. science engineering. So I was reading something that General Electric had done, you know. So I said we should be able to license even to G. And I, I, I remember uh, uh, a young man came to me and said, uh, oh my God, uh, do you realize uh, G's R&D budget is two and a half times India's R&D budget? I said, it's not the power of the budget that matters. It's the power of idea that matters. Yeah. And because you took, talk about G, we'll take on G. And can you believe it? I'll use a technical jargon that is called solid state polycondensation of a polymer called polycarbonate, where they had 40% world market share. Huh? They were leaders. And I changed the culture uh, uh, completely because patenting just didn't exist at that time, all right? And we said not publish or perish, patent, publish and prosper. Sure. Patent and prosper. You know, right. Sarsvati to Lakshmi, that another change I sort of brought in. And it's amazing in 91, three of our US patents were licensed for close to a million dollars. Wow. To, to, to G, same G, whose R&D budget was two and a half times more. And in an area where they were the world leaders. The yes, result yes. of that was Jack Welch. When he saw that, he said, if they are so good, why are we not there? That is where the Jack Welch R&D Center in Bangalore came. And now there are 1,200 R&D centers, by the way. India's emergence as a global R&D platform. You know, people it's call me optimistic. It's fabulous. Sir, you know, I'm going to uh, touch upon something that you mentioned. You know, our journey, because it was a closed economy, was really about trying to do reverse engineering to really... Uh, and indigenous uh, engineering. I think CSIR was also in, involved in the first indigenous tractor that was made in India, for instance, the Swaraj, right? Yeah. And a lot of work was thermodynamics, polymers, et cetera, was done in-house. 
then India became very good at Google innovation. So if there was something that uh, we did very well, it was because we had little resources and that's also something that you alluded to. Now, uh, post-liberalization, uh, do you think we've done enough to really get back on the high table and compete with collaboration? How do you see the post-liberalization phase really in India's scientific journey? I would say that uh, there are, uh, uh, you know, we can't put everything in one basket. There are certain areas uh, where we have done very well and we are ahead of the rest of the world. In certain other areas where we had lead, we have lost it. Let me just give you one example. Uh, take high performance supercomputers. Okay. I remember I was a member of science advisory committee to the prime minister in Rajiv Gandhi's time. And uh, he asked us a simple question, what are we good at? And uh, Dr. Rodan Nasima, uh, you know, was sitting next to me, said, uh, we are good at this. So what do we do with it? And that time, uh, uh, Professor Nasima proposed the idea that we'll create our own supercomputers, which are denied to us by United States because uh, of uh, Soviet Union and security concerns and so on. So he said, we'll make our own but by parallel processing based architecture, which was a completely new thing where everybody was at a level at that time. There's no point in competing with somebody who is 30 years ahead of us, just when we are at, at level. And uh, $10 million in three years uh, were given and Dr. Vijay Bhatkar created CDAC, Center for Development of Advanced Computation. And uh, uh, Param 8000 came up, our own supercomputer, to an extent where we even exported it to uh, uh, USSR uh, later. Now, the major point uh, was that we had uh, taken a lead in this particular field, you know, to an extent where in 1998, when we created uh, uh, this uh, uh, Param 10,000, which was a more advanced version, uh, we were ahead of China, by the way. But today, if you look at the list of top 500 supercomputers, China has 226 out of 500, and we have five. Why is that? Because we did not take the lead. It requires continuous investments like what China did. There are certain areas like chemistry, process chemistry, process engineering, where we continue to be uh, basically the leaders. So I would say that every nation does not uh, become a leader in everything. I think there are certain chosen areas where we have certain strengths, and that is where we should uh, sort of focus. So in many senses, our, our journey in science has also been with a hand tied in the back. And I'm going to explain this. Because consistently, we have lost some of our brightest minds because of the brain drain that happened. You know, of course, a tech revolution resulted in a reverse brain drain, which is also great because Silicon Valley invested in a lot of Indian companies, etc. All of that happened. They came and set up great companies, all of that. But you know what? I was looking at statistics and it's unbelievable, but post-liberalization, our brain drain has been even more worse. In the decade after liberalization, the number of uh, young engineers or young students wanting to go out and once they go out at that very early stage, stay out, has only increased. Now, this is, to my mind, uh, and, and now let's talk about the challenges we face in the country. This is, to my mind, one of the most significant challenges uh, that Indian science faces. What is your view on this? Oh, yes, there is uh, no question about that. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a personal case of reversal of brain drain. I came back because uh, I was enthused with the new dream that uh, Dr. Naiduma was able to sort of project before me. I came back at the age of 32 and I told you about the conditions under which I uh, came back. So what happens, uh, it is not just the physical income, it is the psychic income. And psychic income comes because of the institutional uh, ecosystem that you have, innovation ecosystem that you have, uh, the freedom uh, to think, the freedom to act, uh, uh, of course, commensurate with uh, kind of uh, facilities and so on and so forth. So therefore, it is important to create that. 
but actually there is a good news there is a reversal of brain drain i can quite clearly see that from my vantage point you know uh, and that has happened because of half a dozen different factors by the way one of that was as you know uh, the india has become a global research and development platform so there are 1200 plus companies all right they are able to attract these uh, young people back by the way it is the same people by the way if you look at uh, the patenting activities of these uh, 1200 companies there are many companies where almost one third of the patents are getting generated in india that means indian brains are creating indian iq is creating ip for them they are capable of that because they have been given that particular sort of a, a sort of challenge but whereas we might say oh what's the use indian iq is creating ip for them no they don't stay there this brain drain to brain gain followed by brain circulation because these young people then they move all right and then they occupy positions in iits in industry etc etc you know i was just talking this morning to dr arvind chinchure he was in uh, california he came back to ge set up their ip and from there he came to reliance innovation leadership center he was with me now he has started on his own so that is the brain circulation and i can give you hundreds of such uh, examples that are taken that's number one number two is that our education system also expanded i must give credit to the current government the previous government all governments and the number of central universities increase the number of iits increase etc because we previously unless a uh, teacher retired or died there was no uh, scope now there are huge opportunities like indian institute of science education research you know they have been created and i know for sure because i chaired one of them we were able to get the very best from california i mean uh, from mit from princeton from harvard and so on and so forth so there is a reversal that is taking place because there are greater opportunity that are coming up Sure. And the last part is of course uh, industry industrial enterprises moving into research moving into innovation doing cutting edge uh, things uh, etc etc so these are four or five factors which have but i must say that the way china has done it you know uh, trying to get that our numbers are minuscule from that point of view yeah i i, I, I like the optimism and I, I, of course what you're saying is absolutely true because if india and india is emerging as a R&D hub for the biggest companies. There is an obvious flow of talent back into India. But I want to address an issue which is really uh, close to most Indians' hearts, uh, uh, Dr. Mashekar. Most parents who lament at the fact that in there are not enough institutions to absorb the young young students that India produces. You know, we still have a huge uh, what I would call a a uh, uh, roadblock at the entry level to great institutions already cut offs are 100% the handful of iits you know getting into them is a is a huge exercise and that's a big problem because uh, in uh, i think in 2015 or 16 we spent 45000 crore rupees getting us kids studying abroad i mean that was a kind of drain of wealth that we have seen of parents paying for outside education 45000 crores imagine that coming into great, great institutions where is the gap that you see yeah yeah no that's an excellent question as a matter of fact you know i've seen for example a country like australia i'm sir louis matheson distinguished professor there in monash university this is my 13th year and i see lots of uh, you know our indian students in australia in fact uh, that is the third biggest earner Our education is their third biggest one. It should be ours, as a matter Absolutely. of fact. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that is why I like uh, what this government has done in terms of creating institutes of eminence. Institutes of eminence being ones where there will be complete freedom to do everything. All right. Uh, for example, uh, uh, private sector must play a big role in uh, uh, this. But And, sir, I'm going to stop you there. Already, the big problem is the number of. people who have come into the engineering space and you know there is a problem out there because in every district and we travel extensively into the interiors of india there are engineering colleges by the dozen with what 25 30% occupancy because they don't have the faculty and people are paying top dollar for this in fact i had done an award winning documentary when i was in bloomberg about the gap between these engineering colleges churning out engineers who are unemployable for most companies and there's a 
serious problem with the quality of education. Creating a couple of institutions of in eminence is one thing, but really giving every child an or every student an opportunity to get world-class education is another. Where did we miss out, do you think? Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree with you. You know, it is like this. Uh, you have to uh, create Everest as well as raise uh, the average. Both have to go hand in hand, so as to say. So we do require institutes of eminence, we require IITs, we require ISIS, we require top central universities. But at the same time, the level of uh, education and engineering, what you say is correct. In fact, uh, the number of people who are employable, uh, basically, is uh, a, a rather a small number, you know, from these institutions. And therefore, that quality uh, control is extraordinarily important. In fact, we are creating a crime by creating uh, the, the sort of uh, uh, products, uh, the, you know, by spending the money from, of their parents, their savings, uh, who are unemployable. This is not done. And therefore, there is no question, I totally agree with you, that that uh, level has to uh, basically uh, go up just as we're expanding. But it's a country of a billion, you know, the kind of institution that we require is huge. I, I still remember uh, when I was in Delhi, Director General of CSR, again, member of Science Advisory Committee to the Prime Minister, I still remember we had this discussion. Why six IITs? A country of this size requires 60 IITs. You, you, you get the point. We are a country of a uh, sort of a billion. So therefore, we have to expand, of course, not just the number, but quality. I think that is extremely uh, sort of uh, critical. So there have to be stringent measures. But as I said, I'm very hopeful for a number of uh, reasons. You know, education is not just going to be physical. It's not just going to be digital. It's going to be digital, hybrid learning. And hybrid learning, as long as you are able to uh, create connectivity and digital access, so as to say, you will see it will be transformative. In fact, we have a big challenge, uh, chance of improving the quality of education substantially. In fact, just now I'm chairing uh, the task force for implementing new education policy for the state of Maharashtra. And uh, there are nine subcommittees, and one of them is about the digital part. And it's an amazing report that is coming up now on how digital can be transformative in terms of not only increasing our outreach in terms of quantity, but raising our uh, uh, quality. I mean, if the, the private sector, we've created unicorns who are doing this, really. You know, I mean, uh, and they're uh, tremendously successful. But I'm going to uh, labor on this point a little more because you are also on the advisory board of great institutions. You work with Harvard, you work with uh, Cambridge, you work with uh, great companies. So you're sitting on the top, looking at the best and, and looking at how companies, some of the biggest companies in India, Reliance, Tata Motors, Hindustan Unilever, by the way, Unilever has some of the brightest Indians at the helm globally as well. Where do you see, what are the three, four things you think are critical to do to really bridge the gap? Because we need to do a lot of this change in a hurry, Dr. Mashelka, because you know, we are not, we are also running against time. <laughs> you talked about a subject that is very close to my heart. Uh, <laughs> let me pull up my book. Uh, Yes, I've read this, leapfrogging to pole vaulting. So I'm not trying to advertise the book. I'm trying to tell you about my philosophy. You know, that philosophy is what we are just now talking about. And India is capable of doing that. Let me just uh, explain that because you have raised a very, very important point. See, uh, Reliance has this Reliance Innovation Council. I mean, it's chairman and we have Nobel laureates like John Mary Lane, Nobel laureates like Bob Grubbs and so on and so forth. And, um, uh, you know, Reliance believes in exponential growth, being ahead of the curve and so on. And once Mukesh uh, uh, Ambani uh, and I were talking, so Mukesh Bhai just said, you know, we must leapfrog through something. I said, come on, let's pause. The frog leaps because he's afraid of the predator and he jumps a few feet to safety. We don't want to do that because we are afraid of uh, uh, our competitor. We should pole vault. The size of the pole, determine the size of our aspiration, okay? And we created a program called Beyonders for leadership, by the way, people who are able to think beyond. And you have seen the results during the last three, four years, the way uh, sort of we have moved. It is possible to do that. It's a question of aspiration, number one. 
Number two, uh, just uh, you say, now, now, come on, tell us uh, where have we pole vaulted? I must emphasize that it's a combination of technology, it's a combination of policy, uh, you know, that actually matters and makes a difference. Just look at mobile, all right? We are 155th in mobile data transmission. We did not leapfrog to 100. We pole vaulted to number one. You look at uh, JAM, Jandan Yojana, Aadhaar and mobile, the combination. We created the fastest financial inclusion in the world. In fact, there is a Guinness Book of Record that has been uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, given to us. Look at LEDs, light emitting diodes, which got the Queen Elizabeth Prize of Engineering this year, you know, a million pound prize. It's considered the Nobel Prize in Engineering. I've been on its committee. Look at what India did, for example. In seven years, we moved from just two and a half percent penetration to 88 percent. How did we do that? Innovation. That innovation was in terms of aggregation of uh, uh, demand, so as to say, and bringing the cost down from seven percent to, I mean, uh, sorry, seven dollar to one dollar for a nine uh, WR. All of these examples that we are giving actually uh, substantiate what we are saying that we don't have time on our hand and we can do it basically you know right. I see you, know, uh, you know i remember uh, uh, the first time i met you uh, in person we were at a industry uh, body conference and i was moderating a panel and uh, the panelists were lamenting about the state of the economy of manufacturing and you know what stood out for me is that you stood up uh, 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 from the audience and you said i disagree with that Yes. I am optimistic about India. You are yes. too negative. And I, I really like that because, you know, uh, I think it's important to have optimists like you to, to lead uh, from the front. But my question to you is, so on the whole, numbers look very good, right? But where the uh, tire hits the road, so to say, the tar, so to say, we have a lot of existential issues, you know, and bulk of that is around access. So my simple question to you is that, uh, eight-year-old boy walked from school in Marshall, you know, went on to uh, uh, work on scholarships at a shoestring budget and became one of India's greatest scientists. Uh, you've seen that with Abdul Kalam, you've seen that with a great number of leaders of your generation. Is it possible? Is it easier or more difficult today to do that, you think, for a boy? I, I personally feel it is easier. Far, okay. far, oh yes, there is no question about that at all. The kind of struggles that we had at that point in time, you know, you just compare, young people just don't realize what they have today. You know, there has to be a certain amount of optimism when we see a glass that is half empty, half full, we keep on writing editorials about the half empty part of it. I agree. Let's, 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 let's understand uh, what we have been able to sort of achieve and what we can give uh, to the uh, uh, kids today in terms of uh, sort of access. I think, let me belabor this particular point. India must look at its own strengths and be leader there. And when they become leaders there, as a matter of fact, they can benefit the whole world, not just India. Let me just give one example. I want to emphasize that. We can't be leader everywhere. Like I said, no China 226 supercomputer versus five, et cetera. That's not the place for competition. Where we are great at is inclusive innovation. Where we are good at, is getting more from less for more people. Where we are good at is affordable excellence. You know, I'm a 10x guy, 10 times better, 10 times cheaper, so as to say. And as Prime Minister says, make in India, but make for the world. But word will not take it if you don't have excellence, the quality. So can we make high quality sort of uh, goods at affordable cost? Then we'll be a leader. I'll just uh, give you one example. In my mother's name, I have this Anjani Vashelkar Inclusive Innovation Award. Now, this award is given not to best practice, next practice. I give it to next practice. I'm not a great believer in best practice. Best practice means we are following somebody, some DuPont, some Microsoft. It's a, no, 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 no. We create our own. And this is the 10th year of the award. I will not go through all awards. I will just show you one to just to illustrate my point and where India can go, by the way. That is the optimism we must have. So I actually insist on making high technology work for the poor. Because making high technology work for the rich is very easy. Making low technology work for the poor is very 
is you making high technology work for the poor is difficult. So the award goes to them. All those awardees, they're all startups in their mid 20s and 30s. One of them I will just demonstrate to illustrate how India can not only uh, be uh, a leader, but uh, help the world. Uh, one of the awards went to Rahul Rastogi. His father had a heart issue, so therefore he had to uh, take him in the middle of the night, driving a few kilometers, and then you lie down and put all those, uh, and then after half an hour, nurse gives you the, you know. He said, why can't I create a, a portable ECG, which can be in your pocket? And he created, he was an electronics wizard. And this is that portable issue. Mm. This is called Sanket. How does it work? Simple. You have these two sensors here. You put your thumbs for 15 seconds. You have a sensor here. This is your heart. 15, 15, 15 seconds. 15, 15, 15 seconds. Within three minutes, if you have uh, an app called Sanket Life, download it, that ECG goes to your smartphone. Just imagine the cost of this is to them 500 rupees, by the way. But the cost per ECG turns out to be around 5 rupees, not 500 rupees. It is affordable excellence, fully certified, by the way. US FDA, C certificate, everything. Now, you can just imagine this is transformative. So when I say leapfrogging to pole vaulting, the subtitle is important, creating the magic of radical yet sustainable transformation. Now, how does this represent sustainable transformation? There's a village, there's an old woman, she has a pain, she doesn't have to be put in a bullock cart or something. All that she has to do is use this like a master number. And all of our other problems that we talk about, lack of uh, um, the, uh, you know, paramedical staff, uh, doctors, the, that, et cetera, et cetera, a technological innovation like this can take care of it. And there are other examples like breast cancer, $1 and so on and so forth. You should see what those awards are. What I'm saying is that India, specializes in this. And this is in demand now. This is being sold abroad. In fact, some of those awardees, you know, one of them is in 17 countries now, so as to say. You can, can just make. I think what we should look at is what are our great strengths, uh, you know, and those great strengths are in really creating products with affordable excellence, which will benefit the whole um, world as well as us. I'll right. put it this way. That's a lovely note to end this conversation on, but I'm going to speak in one last question, which is really, you have gone on record, and I've been poring over a lot of your speeches, of your writings. You've gone on record to say one of the things that we need to do is be more irreverent. We need to uh, question more. We need to uh, question uh, the bureaucracy. We need to shake away the bureaucracy. We need to learn to fly. I want to end on that because I think it's a very important uh, note to uh, talk about when we're looking not just at the journey of India, but India ahead, because it's people with uh, audacious ambition that have also shaped a lot of, uh, of, uh, of what we have done. I would say you are audaciously ambitious as well. And that's why you achieved what you did. So if India has to be audaciously ambitious, what should we do? I think we start from education. It all starts from there. You know, in fact, the irreverence word that you used uh, is a very important one. And uh, there is a famous magazine called Science. They asked me to write an editorial. And I said, what India needs is uh, education system or scientific research system, which is more irreverent. In fact, uh, Nobel laureate Feynman basically had said, uh, the challenge is not so much to create new ideas, but getting away from the old ones. And that requires irreverence. And I said, because in India, it is Baba Vakyam Pramanam. You know, uh, sir, we say, yes, sir. The moment you say, sir, you say, yes, sir. You, you, you get the point. And therefore, shaking up that educational system where our young people are able to dream, are able to challenge, are able to question becomes important. Rote learning, from there, we have to move to learning by doing. But not doing what the teacher has said, step one, step two, step three. Learning by creating. And from there to learning by co-creating, so as to say, you know. So that fundamental change, and I'm happy to see the new education policy has some of these elements. I think it has to be start. As, uh, it has to start from uh, there, as a matter of fact. In fact, um, uh, my, one of my talk was on making impossible possible, and I've shown, as a matter of fact, when this is done, when we have challenged 
and we have created new ideas, we have created transformations. India can do it as a, as a, as a matter of fact. You, you know, we have to look at uh, uh, that uh, uh, positive to get back that particular sort of confidence that uh, yes, we can. I mean, we can take inspiration from our uh, cricket team in uh, Australia, for example, when everything was given up and they rose. And, uh, I, I, uh, you know, so the point is the following. Point is the following, if I may just summarize. I remember when we exported the supercomputer, Washington Post carried the headline and, and a small write-up. And the headline was, Angry India does it. Okay? Having been angered that they were denied the technology, they created a supercomputer now that they're exporting. My only suggestion, Mini, is that why aren't we angry every day? In a positive sort of sense, you know, if we bring that spirit, we'll make it. On that note, sir, thank you so much for joining us. It was truly enjoyable, full of insights, and really inspirational to hear you. Thank you. Thank you.